Good afternoon. When I was invited uh, to speak today at this event, TEDx, I didn't know what my subject would be. And not only I didn't know what my subject would be, it should be something that I, I should link with uh, the theme of the, of the event, look deeper. And I just couldn't find something, uh, something relevant. So I remember one time, a uh, couple of, two, one or two years ago, when I was comfortable my, on my couch watching TV, and my young daughter of four years old comes in, without saying anything, by the way, goes in front of the TV and tries to swipe it to change the channel. <laughs> and then I realized that really, you know, technology is in our lives, and we have to really look deeper on how technology change our behavior and how it will, it will do so in the future. So today, I'm going to talk to you about this, how technology is going to affect people's lives and affects our behavior. Of course, there are the pessimists on one side that always describe examples of people being in a restaurant and just checking their phone and never talk to each other and things like that, or like young kids being in front of a computer and playing video games all the time, although I understood from the previous speaker that this is actually good. And, but, you know, I'm not, an, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist, I'm actually an optimist. I believe that technology, if used correctly, can actually improve people's lives and can make people better. So today I'm going to demonstrate, demonstrate that by just going th through a couple of stories of people who have used technology to become better people and to change the world for the better. But before going there, let me talk for just five minutes about one fact the unprecedented ways that technology is evolving at, at this time. We all know that information goes digital. Let me give you some numbers for you to understand what does that mean. Until 2006, the whole digital information was approximately 160 exabytes. In 2009, this, this was increased to, to 500 exabytes. In 2013, this has moved to five zettabytes. Does anyone know what a zettabyte is? A zettabyte is 10 to the power of 21. It's 1,000 exabytes. Right now, we produce 16 exabytes every day of digital information. If you are not convinced, let me give you some other examples. There are approximately 300 billion emails sent every day. There are 100 hours of video being uploaded on YouTube every minute. Okay. Amazon is, se is selling 180 Kindle books for every 100 you know, real books that they sell. All the information is going digital. One other thing that's very important and no one was able to predict you know, since the beginning of the online boom in the late 90s until now, no one has predicted the social network effect, the social media. Okay? Everybody wants to share. I want here to paraphrase uh, Andy Warhol, who once said that every person needs, uh, wants 15 uh, minutes of fame, and I would say that every person needs 15 megabytes of fame, okay? <laughs> L let me give you some numbers also on the social media uh, side. Uh, Facebook has 1.3 billion subscribers. Uh, there are more than, I think, 800 million or 900 million Gmail users. More than 4 billion videos are watched on YouTube every day. Okay? Pinterest, like two years ago, didn't exist. Now, more than 80, 80, million, 80, 80 million users. 6,000 6, tweets are sent every second. Okay? So people really want to share, so don't forget that. One more thing that no one really has predicted a couple of years ago is how we have moved to the cloud. Okay? We were a bit hesitant at the beginning to put our pictures on you know, the servers, but I think it's exactly the same feeling people had 300 years ago when they first put their money in a bank. <laughs> Another mega revolution that started probably in 2007 with the first iPhone and continues now uh, you know, to be a really big part of our life is the mobile revolu revolution, the smartphone revolution. Every one of you has one. Statistically, 20% of you are using it right now as I'm speaking. <laughs> and, you know, this is something that that's really has changed the behavior of ourselves and the people we interact with and everything, okay? You know, the, we never uh, let our, the mobile more than two meters away from us. You know that. It's always next to us. It's the first thing we look at in the morning and the last thing we look at at night. 
Actually, there are statistics that show mobile usage to, to increase between 7 a.m. until 9 a.m., and again from 11 to 12 at night, because we put the alarm, we check the emails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have moved from this picture, which is like the 60s, the favorite of the advertisers, one screen, one message for, to everybody, to probably this picture. Lots of screens and lots of different screens for, uh, for, for the whole family, okay? And actually, this is one of my favorite slides. It shows uh, St. Uh, Peter's Square in the Vatican in, in 2005, when there was the, uh, the, uh, the Pope Benedict was uh, elected. I don't know exactly if he's elected or not. So this was the people standing in St. Peter's Square waiting you know, to hear who's the new Pope. And this is the exact same place, the exact same place in 2013 uh, with uh, Pope Francis, okay? So that really shows... So that really shows how, you know, this mobile revolution has, is affecting our, our lives. Sometimes if we don't have our phones with us, we think things don't happen. Oh, I have to get my phone to do it, okay? So as I said before, we have to look very deeper, very deeply on how all this technological evolution affects our lives. Is it for the better? Is it for the worse? Was it, what is it for? As I told you, I'm an optimist. I believe it's for the better if we do it, we do it right. And I'm going to share with you some stories now. Some stories of regular people who use technology to their benefit and to the benefit of the world. The first one, which is my favorite, is Julius Yego, from a Kenyan guy. Okay, he's actually very young. Uh, he's a javelin uh, athlete. Obviously, you can see that. You know, in Kenya they all all, all do running, but he 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 wants to he wanted to do javelin. But guess what? In Kenya they don't have the the trainers. They don't have any. They don't have the uh, the equipment. They don't have anything to train somebody to go to the Olympics. And his dream was to go to the Olympics. So he used uh, YouTube to try to watch videos and train himself, and he actually did go to the Olympics. He was the first Kenyan guy to ever go to the Olympics, and actually he became an Olympian. Uh, he went to the finals. But, you know, instead of me telling the story, let me, let me just play the video. The javelin is inborn in me. The first time I threw a javelin, we were just using a stick. Some boys were competing. And then something came into my mind and told me, you can beat these guys. When I broke the junior record, I thought that my life now will change. And in Kenya, it's not easy no coach to guide me. I was just alone in the field, training. My father wanted me to leave all things. Everybody here in Kenya is a runner. I took it as a challenge to find another way to succeed. I started watching videos. The last step, look. The elevation of that javelin is just on your height, the level of your height. I could see that uh, training like these people can improve me. I started now using a different mode of training. Team exercises, flexibility exercises, everything changed. I was always increasing my distance. My coach is me and the YouTube videos. I was doing better and better. I won the first goal ever for Kenya. In the same event, I broke the national record. I went even to the Olympics. Imagine being in the finals in the Olympics. There was no light. Yeah, I was in the end of the tunnel. Uh, here in Kenya, I have a nickname that uh, Mr. YouTube man. <laughs> you know, as the world progresses, everything changes. So maybe one time, many people will be learning through videos. The answers are here. Another story that I want to share is very, very different. Uh, it's from a very poor country called, called Timor-Leste, 
It's on the south of Indonesia, just north of Australia. It was it is a very new country, very poor. A lot of people live in rural areas, and they're very poor. So most half of the births in births in the country uh, happen at home. Okay, so there were a, a lot of maternity deaths. Okay, because women didn't know what to do. They didn't get any advice. They didn't they didn't know anything. But guess what? Even in a poor country like Timor Leste with you know, such big problems and poverty and people living in rural areas, most, more than 70% of people had mobile phones. And the government took advantage of that. They, 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 they started a program where uh, they, they created some applications and they connected pregnant women with midwives, mares, okay, with midwives, where they can discuss uh, things and they can give them a simple advice that all this has, uh, has, uh, has a uh, resulted in decreasing death rates by more than 50%. And that just happened, okay? How the use of a mo mobile really changes lives. Another very interesting story. Uh, this is the story of uh, Jack Andraka in the US, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, who at 70 years old, still at high school, developed a new rapid and inexpensive uh, method of detecting uh, a protein that, the, that the, the, presence of, the presence of this protein uh, indicates that there is pancreatic cancer. Well, it's complicated. I, I don't know how he did it like in high school. Anyway, this guy is at high school in his biology class, and he's just interested why so many people die from pancreatic cancer. And he reads a lot of stuff on Wikipedia, Google, YouTube videos, etc., and he realizes that people die because they, they didn't detect it earlier. So he starts reading stuff, starts reading uh, uh, online scientific journals, more videos on YouTube, uh, sends emails to people. It's just connected and develops a new and inexpensive method that detects pan pancreatic cancer very early and saves people lives. And he did that at 17. And like all these great stories, you know, he developed a method and created a business plan and everything and sent it to around 200 professors around the US. Of course, he got 199 no's and just one yes from a professor from uh, John Hopkins University and the rest in history. By the way, the other guy on the picture is Barack Obama. <laughs> Another story, success story, uh, of how we can use the internet to our advantage. This is the story of an eight-year-old entrepreneur, millionaire, called Harley Jordan, okay? Uh, this guy, used to play with marbles. Well, sorry, I have to say this in Greece. Marbles in billes, okay? Because I didn't know we called it marbles in, in, in English. Anyway, I, my grandparents used to play with this, but I, I guess it's a new trend in the US. So he used to play with them, trade them with his friends, and suddenly he lost all his stock and he couldn't find more. So he goes to his mother and begs her to start a site so he can trade more uh, marbles with other kids. And this site becomes a success. Whatever he buys, he sells it again. And now he has a very successful business. He's eight years old. Well, he's not eight years old now. Probably this is like two years ago or something. Now he's like 10, 11. He's the CEO of a company called the Marble King. Eight years old. Okay? So if you want a business plan, that's it. <laughs> the last story that I want to share is, uh, not the last, I have one more. Actually, this story, probably you have seen this. Uh, it's a guy, uh, Haris Ioannou, uh, Greek, uh, who developed an exoskeleton glove uh, for people who have, uh, uh, they cannot move their arms correctly. You know, he got th this idea by uh, looking at his grandmother, who couldn't move her hand. So he did it all by himself. He's a high school student also, okay, amazing. So he bought all the stuff himself, he trained himself on the internet, he read stuff, and he created this glove. This, uh, this is an amazing invention, okay? And, you know, this, uh, and his uh, goal is to take this into production, sell it for uh, as cheaply as, I don't know, 400 or 500 uh, euros, and really help save lives of people. The last but not least is uh, a story of a hospital in Bangalore, India. Okay, it's not in the U.S., it's not in the U.K., it's in Bangalore, India, where doctors wear Google Glasses on the intensive care units so that they, immediately, so that they can immediately check a patient's report 
file when they come in. With that way, uh, intensive care doctors have increased the number of patients by, they see by 300%. Okay? Again, how technology saves life. These were just a couple of stories. Okay? Of course, there are other more stories that we can share. There are many, many different things that's happening. I want to conclude by what I, I, I said before. Technology is progressing in unprecedented ways. Nobody can predict. Whoever comes here and tells you this is going to happen in the next few years, probably he's wrong. Nobody knows. Okay? The thing is that whatever happens is going to really affect our lives. Okay? How it's going to affect our lives, it's up to us to decide. Okay? We can make technology work for us and make us a better people and the world, or the world a better place. Thank you very much.